by welcoming Lieutenant Colonel Mark Williford. Please welcome. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for the warm welcome. Mark Mitchell invited our team of engineers from the Galveston District Corps of Engineers to be a part of the town hall last night. And then uh, I, I shared with him, I said, next time you have an event like this, be sure to continuously invite us to these, okay? But um, on behalf of Colonel Lars Zetterstrom, who is the commander of the Galveston District Corps of Engineers, he wanted me to personally express his sincere appreciation for the invitation, the opportunity to come share information about the emergency dredging project on the west uh, fork of the San Jacinto River. Uh, he personally asked me to, to come and interact with uh, those individuals here that uh, have influence, that have uh, concerns, and I just want to encourage you, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to visit with me. Uh, I have direct access to the commander. Uh, he's specifically tasked over 20 uh, engineers within the organization to work on this emergency project. So it has his utmost concern and attention. Um, with that being said, uh, this is going to be a challenging project, but we're confident we're going to be able to reduce the risk of flood mitigation and, and meet the requirements that FEMA has set forward. So at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Eddie uh, Aragoyen, who's one of our project managers, or is the project manager, and he'll be followed by Michael Garski, uh, one of our hydraulic engineers. So, Eddie. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Again, thank you all for having us today. I know several of you all were at the Kingwood meeting last night. So those that heard the presentation is the same one. And you already asked your questions last night, so you don't get questions today. <laughs> so... Um, real quick, so here's a couple pictures. I mean, we want to show everybody why we're doing it. Um, this is an emergency job. It was given to us as a mission assignment from FEMA. Uh, mission assignment was given to us April 3rd. Uh, this mission assignment is given to us just like any other mission assignments, like a blue roof mission, debris mission, similar with that. I mean, this, this technically is being called debris mission because we are removing debris from the San Jacinto River as well as dredging the, the sand that's there. So um, these pictures are just a couple pictures of after Harvey. Um, I'm pretty sure everybody here is familiar with, with these areas and these post pictures. We just want to make sure that the contractor is aware of the impact that the area took from Harvey and the emergency of of what we're trying to do. I mean, this is a big project that we're telling them to do and we're asking them to do it in a quick um, timeline as, as, our, our, as the opposite of our, our, our normal timeline. And I'll go into more specifics as what our current schedule is we're gonna give to the contractor or whoever gets the contract versus our usual regular timeline as a business as usual. So uh, here's a quick some project information. Um, again, this was authorized by FEMA assignment. Uh, that's just the number SW30. Um, again, it was given to us on April 3rd. So from then we, you, whoa, what happened? Okay. Um, from there we started running. I mean, I would even say maybe even sprinting to get this job going. Um, the history, um, you know, as you all know, is mainly all the debris that, that was there on the river causing for flooding afterwards. And so what, that's, that's what we're trying to do to eliminate any future flooding. And we're trying, our goal is to get that river to pre-Harvey pre conditions. Now, the challenge in this job has been that this is not a federal channel. So we've never dredged this channel before. Therefore, we, to get the history before it, it's, it has been difficult. Because usually our jobs, I mean, we're considered the experts for our normal jobs. So we've been dredging those channels for, I don't know, 30, 40 years. So we know the conditions. We know how it is before a storm. We know how it's when during the year um, it's going to fill up the quickest or and, and so on. So we always do pre-storm surveys and we do after-storm surveys just to see the difference. Here we didn't have any pre-storm 
surveys. So uh, Mr. Garski will get into more detail of how we accomplish uh, our scope of work and, and the challenge that we had with that. Uh, the description, so again, the, the work consists of the removal of the show material from the West Fork. Uh, currently, we have approximately is 1.9 cubic yards that we're going to be removing from the river with a bunch of debris and trees that we're telling the, the contractors. Our estimate right now, um, since the contract is currently on the street, we still haven't had a bid opening, so I can't really go into the details, but it is out there. Uh, we did put a range that we're able to share with everybody, and it's from 25 to 100 million. I know that's a huge window, so. So, I want to give everybody, of, for those that, and I'm pretty sure almost not everybody's familiar with our process, we are a government agency, so unfortunately we do, I don't want to say we take our time, but we really go into the details of our <laughs> projects. So usually for a new project, what we call a new start, for example, something like this that we have no previous information, no data, we would do a study. A study normally takes approximately three years. So of course we didn't have that time to do a three year study. Um, and then after we do the study, then we do the design, depending of the, the scope of work, design varies from anywhere from Six, to, six months to a year and a half. And then of course we build it, and then after that we maintain it. Now, the important thing with the maintenance here, again, this is not a federal channel, so we will not be doing the maintenance. We're gonna, do, we're gonna be dredging it based on the emergency task that we got, and then after that it is not, would not be our duty to do the maintenance. So we do have a final package at the end, a report of what we recommend for either the city or I'm not sure if it's a Harris County Flood Control District or San Jacinto River Authority on what's the best thing to keep it maintained to prevent flooding in the future. Now, uh, one thing that I do wanna, sh for everybody to see is if you see, no pointer, <laughs> the brakes. <laughs> The Congressional Project Authorization. So every phase we do need uh, authorization from Congress and money. So again, since this is not a federal, uh, typical federal job, that does not apply. Uh, FEMA is giving us the money and we're, you know, we're going ahead with the, with the project. Oops, wrong way. So um, again, I wanna emphasize on our schedule. Um, our typical, an uh, average job like this magnitude if we would have started in April, we would have, and after designing and doing, first doing our field investigation, which is surveys and modeling, that usually takes about two to three months. This one we did in like two weeks. Um, the, the design of it, we did it in another two weeks with review. So, I mean, that usually takes about six, seven months. So we advertised this job, it hit the streets on May 18th with our typical normal schedule it would have advertised in approximately September 19th. So currently we are scheduled to award in 20, uh, 29 June, the end of the month. We're hoping to and then from there we're hoping we have a contractor. The contractor should start dredging about a month from there. Again the magnitude of this job normally we want to give enough time to a contractor that way small businesses and everybody has an equal opportunity to compete for the job and actually um, do the contract. We want them to succeed. We don't want them to set up to fail. So usually on a typical job like this, it would normally take about two years for 1.9 cubic yards. We're asking the contractor an estimated, um, right now it says there's six months, I think, that might change or we're still in the talk of talks with our partners over that because our scope did go up. So, but our plan either way is for the contractor to finish dredging by spring of next year. I mean, we're gonna go, we're gonna be out there in the middle of hurricane season right now and do a lot of praying that we don't get any storms this summer. And, but we wanna be out of there before next year's hurricane season. So that's the plan. I keep going the other way. Uh, so here's our project area. Um, when the, 
the task group was assigned to us, it was just, they told us dredge between Highway 69 and West Park, West Lake Park, I can never say it right. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, after Mr. Garski did his, his study, and he based it off on the 2000? 2000 Texas Water Development Board, that's where we got a lot of information. So he, f he came up with the conclusion that these are the areas that we have to dredge, and I don't want to steal his thunder, he'll, uh, he'll go into more detail. And the two placement areas that we're going to put this material is, if you see, I don't know if you can see the hashed areas, there's one uh, over there west, north. So there's that one, and there's the other one northwest, thank you. Uh, those will be the two placement areas that our material will be going. So um, we have gone calls of you know people offering closer placement areas to the job, which yeah it would speed up the the time of the contract and it'll probably make things cheaper. The reason we went with those is just so we can make sure that it uh, follows our um, environmental rules. I mean, there's no permits needed, there's no permits required. We will be doing our NEPA process after the fact, so we want to make sure that we're not um, putting any material outside in wetlands, or that's gonna cost any mitigation for us in the future. So normally a job being this magnitude, what we would like to do, you know, getting a 1.9 million cubic yards of beautiful sand, I mean, we wanna do good things with that sand. We wanna do some environmentally sound projects, some ecosystem restoration. Unfortunately, due to the time and the constraint of um, our mission assignment that FEMA's giving us, we're not, we're not able to do that. Um, this is our, my, uh, I call it my NASCAR page, you know, showing our sponsors. Um, this is our collaboration with others. Um, like I, I, I emphasize that we don't have any previous history on this project. So we had to collaborate with everybody, so with USGS, City of Houston, the San Jacinto River Authority, uh, the Harris County Flood Control District to get all this information. And I know I missed a couple of logos out there. Apologize. Uh, we've also been uh, communicating with TxDOT because they have construction currently in the uh, on Highway 59. So we need a, we need you know the last thing we want to do is impact that bridge for it to you know we don't want it to collapse. So we, we're coordinating with them. They also have they also have issues and they have a future contract and I'm gonna get it right. Westlake Houston Parkway. All right. <laughs> So we're coordinating with them on when they're gonna do their construction there as well. We wanna make sure that our dredging doesn't impact that bridge either, so. So that's it for me. Um, now I wanna introduce Mr. Uh, Mike Garski. He is one of our H&H &H engineers and he's a young millennial, so please give him a break. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Garski. Uh, I'm a hydraulic engineer for the Army Corps in Galveston. Uh, fresh there, four years. Um, been a whirlwind adventure on this, uh, on this project. Um, so one of the things that I did was I brought in some technical experts from uh, our Mississippi, uh, ERDIC, um, our engineering research center over there in, in Mississippi, Vicksburg, um, in order to look at the morphology of the region in order to get a better understanding as to how this region changed due to Harvey itself. One of the things that he brought up was uh, the San Jacinto River Authority um, did a study on the effects of Harvey, uh, the floodwaters during Harvey, uh, in order to determine where the sediment was coming from. Uh, they, did, uh, they did a study and they were, sh they were showing that a lot of the flow was not coming down the East Fork, most of it was coming down the West Fork. Um, coming into Lake Houston, so that's one of the reasons why we're mainly focusing on the West Fork for our project. Um, another thing that we did was we looked at the 2000 uh, Texas Water Development Board um, study to see where all of sedimentation was coming from. Uh, one of the things that, that I thought was interesting and uh, surprised me was most of the sediment is not coming from the West Fork itself. Uh, it's mainly coming from Cypress Creek and Spring Creek. Uh, that's uh, just under 45, uh, just under 65 percent. I think it's for, uh, 43, uh, 63 percent uh, is coming from 
the Cypress Creek and Spring Creek areas. Um, and I actually have here um, some examples of that. We actually had a, uh, our river in engineer pointed this out to me. So these are our sloughing side banks. Um, and so that deposit is a lot of sediment downstream. Uh, and then there's huge sandbars along Spring Creek. Um, unfortunately, whenever that gets up into high flow, it picks up that sediment and brings it downstream as well. Um, so that was one of the things that I wanted to mention to everybody is uh, it needs attention. And um, that's one of the things that we were pointing out inside of our study was this is where our sediment's coming from. And it's dropping right in the middle of our project. Um, so our project. Uh, so that's Westlake Houston Parkway with a giant tree on it. Uh, and uh, just to point out this, this right here used to be about four and a half, five feet above the water surface with a bunch of trees on top of it. Uh, that, that right there is now two to three feet deep of water and it flows like the normal river. Uh, that's what Harvey did. Um, the main channel used to be back here on this side and uh, it's about two to three feet deep on that back channel as well. So one of our pro uh, so part of our project is to go in and make it like what it was before. Except for we're not gonna be filling that in, we're going to be digging the other channel deeper. Um, another thing, another part of our study was to go back and look at what it was historically, because one of the reasons why, what our funding is purely based off of going to pre-Harvey conditions only. So we had to determine what was the difference between all of our previous models and all of our previous studies to determine what was exactly 2017, August, before Harvey. Uh, so we went back and looked at all of the terrain and all of the morphology of the region beforehand, all the way back to 1978, and uh, we can see a nice alluvial large river coming into Lake Houston. <clears throat> that river is very small now. Um, one of the things that happened over time between 1978 and pre-Harvey was trees, sedimentation, a lot of things developed inside of this area encroaching on the river itself. And so one of the things that we determined was, uh, well, that was one of the things that I used in order to recalibrate the model that I was, that I was informed, that, that I used in order to that I used in order to model our, our project. So that being said, I put our, I put, the, I used the 2007 FEMA floodplain model. It's a, a, flood, a flood insurance model. Um, you guys use it to pay your, your uh, flood insurance off of it. Um, so I used that, I updated the, uh, the side banks in order to include the, the, higher, um, the higher resistance of the trees and everything like that. And, uh, and then I dropped in the 100 year flood plan. Uh, so that's a lot of flooding. Uh, that's actually not even Harvey. Harvey was the 500 year above that. So uh, one of the things that I did was is I, I was trying to get back to what it was pre-Harvey. Um, the bottom line here is what was there pre-Harvey. The top line is what it is after Harvey. So what I did was I came in and I redid the model to where we got rid of these giant humps here. These giant humps are where you can actually see the land above the, the river surface. Uh, it's right next to the golf course um, and uh, River Grove Park. Uh, that's, where it, that's where this hump is. Um, so one of the ways that I did that was I took the channel cutting tool inside of Hecras, um, and essentially cut a straight channel uh, along the stream center line the whole way through in order to get our quantities. Um, and our majority, the majority of our dredging is in between River Grove Park here. This is where that island is. Uh, and the marina over here on the, on the east side of uh, Westlake Houston Parkway. Um, If you want more information about our, our, um, our study, before we actually do our report, this 2000 um, Texas Water Development Board report is where we did most of our information, where we got most of our information mining from. Um, and uh, this was provided to us by uh, Harris County Flood Control. Um, 
they, <clears throat> inside of this report, they go over a financial study as to what was the most beneficial dredge areas uh, in order to benefit this area the, the most. Um, we used their sections in order to put it inside of our newer model in order to determine where to dredge at. Um, we, <clears throat> we also use our term, uh, so you might hear some of the terminologies of A, B, C, and D. That, that terminology comes from this report. Uh, they, they also predicted this inside of the report that there would be a shoal in the exact areas that there's a shoal in right now. So that being said, we as the Army Corps are going to propose additional projects and, for, and further projects on top of what we're doing because we're only allowed to make it what it is pre-Harvey, not improve it. So we would like to improve the area. We have, we, have, we have the ability inside of CAP studies and other project funds uh, and, and other project abilities to do that, but it's through your local government in order to, in order to facilitate that with us. Like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that we did with uh, with the um, with our research engineer from Erdic was he proposed uh, he proposed to shut off or or mitigate the the stream diversions that are happening right now. So just to point something out, the, this is this is the back area that goes up next to the uh, the golf course. There's two areas right here, which doesn't show up on the screen very well, but they're about 12 to 14 feet deep channels that go right back to this golf course. Um, that allows a lot of energy to be take, to be dissipated from the main channel. This right here is about two to three feet deep. And then you go over to this channel over here and it's about 16 feet, 17 feet as well. So <clears throat> the way that this looks is Almost no water flows through the main channel of this system. Almost all of it flows on the outside. So what's going to happen is, is as, this, as this continues, and if we don't solve the side channel problems, this middle area will just shoal right back in again. It'll take a couple years, but that's one of the reasons why we propose continuing projects. And a nice devastating, this right here is the channel that I'm talking about. Uh, this, all, this used to be land across here. It's now a nice cut back into the golf course. Um, so <clears throat> without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Lester. Um, he's uh, the next talker. Okay, I'm the next talker. Uh, um, control, control L. Um, I'm I'm joined here with one of my colleagues, Dr. Arturo Leon, as well. He's a he's a he's a he's an hydraulics engineer, and he has a little bit more than five years experience. So, the the big guys are sitting on that table over there. Um, and uh, what we would like to do as a group of university, um, university uh, professionals in development is to collaborate with all of the various agencies um, so that we can all move forward um, our different areas around the region. We have a very, very large region. Everybody recognizes that. And it's really difficult for us to for most of us to understand how to prioritize. And because of that, we all want to make sure that our interests are protected. And so I don't live in this area, but I recognize that unless this area is fully functional, it's gonna affect the entire region. And so because of that, you know, our good friends at the core are willing to sidestep the, the, the 1969 NEPA requirements for an environmental study beforehand. And, and nobody here is gonna say, don't do it, right? Because, because we understand that at this point we have a priority that we need to handle. How do I, okay, here we go. <laughs> so we're proposing a study uh, with the Lake Houston Chamber um, in three uh, different segments. The first segment is meant to be a really quick 
uh, assessment and something that could be used um, for them to start advancing communication and various projects that could help this region, specifically with regards to capturing that, that uh, bond issue that's supposed to be coming out pretty soon, and of course the GLO funding as well that the county and the city um, are, are lining up with. And I'll show you a map in the future, but this, this region is particularly uh, tricky because there's several overlapping jurisdictions, right? There's city of Houston, there's county. Um, you know, we just heard that this channel that was just mentioned isn't even considered technically federal domain, but most channels are. Right? So there is this interesting interplay between Harris County Flood Control District, the Army Corps of Engineers, and of course now the new uh, San Jack Authority. Um, so the first phase is a really quick phase study, and I'll go through the different phases with you. Um, it's a lot of text on here, so I'll actually run through these rather fast, and you can see me afterwards and we can chat about some of the details or speak to the chamber to understand more. Um, but I want to get to the maps at the end. Um, as soon as possible. So the first phase, four months, the goals are convening stakeholders, right? We, we don't want, we want people to feel as if they have a good sense of what to ask for. You know, the mayor complains that he gets a tour, people invite him in, he actually manages to get it on his schedule, he shows up. And, and what's happening when he shows up? He, he, doesn't, he doesn't get the ask from people. People aren't able to say to him, this is what we need and we need you to help us with it. And, and because of that, it makes it really difficult for him to advocate on our behalf. And so the first uh, 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 goal that we'd like to accomplish here is to make sure that the chamber can continue to you know, uh, reliably organize uh, folks in a room to get the word out properly. Of course, we're gonna assess the spatial extent of the damage, and I'll, again, I'm gonna show you the maps uh, uh, a little later. It's a huge area, so bear with us. Uh, we're gonna build our own morpho model and hopefully we could collaborate with the core on that just to make sure that we're speaking in the same language and not missing anything. Um, and so we have a sedimentologist on, on, on our team as well, Jeff Nitrauer from Rice University. And Jeff has studied uh, a lot of these creeks and he's doing some work in China as well with a similar river. In, in any event, what we're talking about is, yes, building up um, intelligence that isn't just useful now, but could be used over time. Because you, I think you, what you should take away from the original presentation was between 1979, 1970s, and now, there really was not a lot of work done in maintenance. And we'll talk about whys. We can all talk about whys. Um, and then the next one is to prepare this recovery plan that the chamber can use uh, to advance the interest of this region. Uh, phase two, I'm sorry, this is a little bit more of the details with regards to what goes into phase one. Um, we're constantly improving what could be offered in this four months because we want to capture, you know, this sense of urgency. And so what we've done was to separate it out between priorities and, you know, a, a primary stage and a secondary stage. Primary stage, build a model, evaluate the impacts, and deliver the model, look at the priorities in terms of the projects. We don't have time in four months to properly vet each project properly, but what we can do is convene experts to take a look at the proposed projects and to give a sense as to whether, you know, the feasibility of these things. And again, the more various agencies participate in this at the beginning, um, you, you get the sense then that we could be sure we're on the right track going forward. The second phase, 18 month study, it takes a long time to do these models properly because the team is actually out there walking, scouting, looking at aerial, aerials. This is not a desktop study. To, to do it properly. So this is the real meat and potatoes study that uh, would be the follow-up. And in that look at the area, we could do things like look at the business location strategy, look at golf courses and see where they're placed to understand whether or not this is, a, if this is the ideal uh, spot for, for a golf course or whether the golf course as it's built is built in the right way to handle the changes in the river, the natural thing, the natural flow of the river what components of the river are anthropogenic and which components are ecologically necessary. We, we heard earlier about the need for this river to maybe change courses. So should we allow that change of course or is it okay to divert it back to the main channel? Or are we gonna just be basically chasing our own tail, so to say, right? So it takes a while to really understand this properly and we do not want to produce something that 
you know, would jeopardize, you know, your long-term interests and, of course, our, our universities that we're, we're uh, representing here. So we can look at a, a few different things in terms of, uh, I'm sorry, I must be blocking your, <laughs> your view here. Um, and then uh, on the building capacity for, for resilience, we talked about the transportation systems as well, looking at vulnerable and priority areas. Uh, you heard a lot about the wastewater treatment plants. You know, these are priority assets that we need to protect. And when they become vulnerable, they actually endanger our health. Um, and so we, we shouldn't have to deal with, you know, sewage uh, spills. Uh, we know that it's a problem, so what can we do to protect ourselves from that? Um, in terms of the systems modeling, we, we talked about that earlier. And as far as deliverables are concerned, it would be the really robust resiliency strategies that could come out of that effort. Um, and the, then the follow-up would be an implementation plan. Uh, many of you may or we don't have a big history of planning in this region, right? We do project-based development. And project-based development is done really, really well in this region, in this state, actually. Um, uh, nothing gets built unless there's a certain amount of success that's hinged on it. And so we want to have an implementation plan as well that comes on the heel of this to make sure that we're not just doing a desktop study and to make sure we can continue, right? What, when, when the core proposes these other projects, right, what would be the vehicles? How, how can we help to make sure that they're implemented? And, and also, what other projects outside of the core's jurisdiction should we be adding onto that tab as well? Because we need to be thinking about our children and our children's children and certainly our investments, um, as, as this particular group might be, is, is so well aware of. Um, and, and this implementation plan could take, could take the form of a combination of administrative actions, you know, what are those technical studies, organizational changes, or policies that need to be in place, regulatory actions, you know, again on the policy side, and infrastructural standards. Uh, for instance, you know, we've heard a lot about um, uh, elevated highways that have uh, berms underneath, that have fill underneath, perhaps blocking the flow of water, right? So maybe we should have all our highways on pylons, especially those that cross the 500-year floodplain or the 100-year floodplain, right? It's a small thing that we might not have thought about in the future, but could really make the difference in, uh, I'm sorry, thought about in the past, but might make a, a difference in the future with regards to the flow of water uh, in our region as it tries to get to the San Jack and eventually to the Gulf. And financial actions, of course, right? Where is the money coming from? Right? Uh, so Harris County Flood Control District has a certain amount of a budget that they control. The city has a certain amount of budget that they control. The core has to be dependent on Congress. So if each, uh, if each uh, uh, group may or may not feel as if they're constrained, then you know, if perhaps falls on us, who are really the stakeholders here, to identify ways in which we can unleash you know, other funds. Yes, we're knocking on the door of the state and the rainy day fund seems to continually be, be locked, but what other kinds of investments or, or financial mechanisms can we make available? Because we're definitely gonna need that. And so we need to put some thought into what that means as well to match our projects with the sense of implementation. Um, I, I wanted to, I couldn't end this conversation. I was asked to speak for 15 minutes. How am I doing with time? Okay. So I couldn't end the conversation. I'm a planner. I'm an urban planner. You have to excuse me. I have to show a map. And I couldn't end without uh, us all feeling as if we, we recognize that everything that happens in the north of the county affects this area. Okay. The pointer isn't working, so I'm going to have to use my finger here. So this is the Lake Houston Chamber area. This blue is the San Jacinto watershed. This green is the Cypress Creek watershed. So as, as you guys look at the bond and try to figure out how the projects might be affecting your area, don't just look at the watershed that we're in right now. Because everything in the, in the north and northwest of the county flows that away. Right? So you've got to look at Cypress Creek, Little Cypress Creek. You've got to look at uh, the Sand Jack. Um, and the good news is that half of the area actually de is not dependent on the northern watersheds. That's this half, the Greens Bayou watershed. 
Greens Bay watershed doesn't flow laterally towards or east to west, to, uh, west to east, excuse me, towards Sanjak. It does something really interesting. It goes south, which means that all the water on this side of, which means the, the issues, any flooding issues that occur on approximately half of your area or the south and southwest of the area is a different issue altogether and it's probably not actually related to uh, the amount of water and sand and silting that's coming down Sanjak. Although if this dam fails, yes, the water will, will, will expand itself out, but normally and also with uh, higher levels, it's a, it's a different area here. It's a different problem and it is probably a more manageable problem because the problem here is, is basically localized within the Greens Bayou uh, uh, watershed. Um, so that's the first component I wanted to mention is when you, when you start thinking about your area, your area is actually the entire north of Harris County and look at how far north the San Jack watershed goes. It also goes into Montgomery County. So how can, how can we actually do anything with Montgomery County? Right? Anybody in this area needs to start thinking, I'm not just a Harris County resident, right? I also have to worry all of a sudden. I mean, the, the college understands that very well, right? So it's not something out of the ordinary. It's just a different way of framing our context that we have to be concerned with Montgomery County. However, as I said, the south and the southwest of the, of the, uh, of the area is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a different uh, uh, solution set than, and probably uh, something that would be lower cost and lower investment than the north and the north uh, eastern side of the, the seven, the six, six zip code area, six zip codes, okay. Um, because of the light, you can't really see this very well, but uh, this, this pretty much just shows a, 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 a more uh, zoomed in version of that original look. And so, so this, this red area is the, uh, is the outline of the, Lake Houston is the eastern boundary of, this, of the six zip code area. And the area in white is the greens, the greens area. So it really shows then, and, and this, this, uh, this orange kind of lighter, like tan color, is the 100-year floodplain. Uh, so this area should be looking at ways then to reduce that floodplain, thinking of it as spillage, perhaps. And you can see it's not a very, it's, it's not a very invasive area in there. And so again, it's something that, that you know, it's a little bit easier, but it also means that you guys need to start looking at the projects identify for the Greens Bayou area and Greens Watershed, excuse me, and not just the Sanjak. Um, we, the, the other speaker already spoke about this with regards to uh, where the sand is probably coming from. I know a lot of people are looking at these creeks, spring, the West Fork and Cypress as, you know, culprits. Where is my sand coming from? That's bothering me. Um, and I, I was pleased to, to, to hear that the core is actually justifying also what our team, our, our uh, sedimentologists just took a, a look at the aerials, looked at the sand and said, it's not clear that the sand issue is coming from the sand mining operations. In order to really understand what's going on here, we need to look underground to understand what's happening. And so they are doing the exact same thing. I'm sorry, I'm pointing at you, but the core. The core is, is definitely on track with recognizing that we look, need to look at the morphology of the area to understand what's happening. And we also need to do the same thing as well. My, our, our position is going to be to look at the rivers and how these rivers are actually changing course. Because, and I'll go back, I'll go back. When you look at this orange area, the 100-year floodplain, when you look at it on your own maps, Think of it as if the river were to burst its banks, this is the space it needs. But in many cases, the river is all natural because it may, may or may not have been channelized. So this is really the, the area that the river wants to grow in. And, and look at this dramatic change here between the blue and the orange. Do we, do we understand why this is the case? Because of the dam. But naturally, the river wants to do this. That's what it wants to do. And so we have to pay attention to, yes, recognizing that we do need to look at ecological function, but people need to live here and do business here as well. And so it's a balance, because if we don't get it right, we might be repeating the same problem in the future. 
And that's it for my presentation. Thank you guys very much. I'll take it, since nobody else is jumping up and grabbing that. All right, so um, we have some time for questions. Um, so let's see, how should we do this? Maybe, can we have you three guys come on up here and then we'll just ask anybody that has questions. You can direct them then to our three, our three speakers. Okay, does anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Who are you directing that question to? <laughs> I can't, so. So unfortunately with the task that we have right now, it limits our scope to what we have right now. Now I would recommend, um, we do have other capabilities with the core, either through our CAP process. Um, our CAP is targeted for smaller scale projects where we do, we look at the area, we study it for about a year, and we design a project and we construct it. That are, just like all, all of our other business lines, we do have, we do need a non-federal sponsor, which that means is usually 50-50 on the cost, and from the federal side, it goes up to approximately $10 million. So, I mean, we do have several options um, for us to have projects out there for us to look at. And, but unfortunately, right now, to answer your question, we're not looking at the Conroe area. So I, I'd like to add to that by saying uh, well, one of the, I've been hearing three major pieces of rhetoric with regards to what needs to happen, right? Those three buzzwords, and we can all probably say it together. Third reservoir, right? We need uh, an arm down in the ship channel, and we need buyouts. Um, there's a fourth, right? We've heard this call for a regional flood authority. Um, based, on the, based on the size of the watershed and the watershed, the major watershed of the San Jacinto River, we are really dealing with a north-south option. So this regional watershed doesn't have to technically include anyone to the west or east of us, but definitely Montgomery County. And so one of the things that, that, that we should talk about is how we can actually advance that to happen. Because if, unless we do that, we can't properly Right, Harris County is doing a bond for Harris County, but a lot of that water comes from the north. Is Montgomery County also floating a bond, right? So, so that would address this question that you, you asked with regards to what can happen with Conroe. So we definitely need to think about the Harris County, Montgomery, if no others, to be this, this uh, cooperating entity with regards to flooding. For those of you who don't know, um, who just spoke is Mark Micheletti, and he is um, on the SJRA board. Um, he was appointed along with uh, Karin, what's Karin's last name? Kamio. So we appreciate his service on that. Um, okay, you had a question?
We were saying back then the catastrophic flood was not if, but when. Well, we saw that a year ago, but not, no money was put towards it during the drought. Of course, that was also during the Great Recession as well. So uh, I'm hearing all this pre-Harvey, 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 but pre-Harvey really goes way back, not just a year ago, okay? Because if we just go back to pre-Harvey, we're waiting for another catastrophic flood. And I do appreciate the efforts, but just going back to where we were a year ago is not going to do anything uh, other than clean some of the debris out, number one. Number two, we haven't talked anything about, uh, and I know that's not part of your scope of work, but Lake Houston, uh, during the drought, you could almost walk across the old railroad bed all the way from Atascocita to Huffman. That's how shallow it was. Uh, so we haven't talked about that. We haven't talked about uh, the uh, upgrades to the, the dam, increasing the gates and so forth. So it has to be a coordinated effort by multiple entities to not just dredge the river, but create more capacity in the lake and creating the ability to pre-release uh, downstream as well as uh, uh, getting the water from Conway as well. Do you have a question for them? No, it's just more okay. of a comment of, of, of the overall picture. And when y'all are doing your studies, are you seeing that? Are you looking at that? And, and how would that process work going forward? Good question. Uh, I'll let you go first. Yeah, so, so you, you're absolutely right. And, and uh, what we proposed um, early is a, a three-pronged kind of an approach um, that would consider business as usual. Business as, as usual would be the, the dredging that's ongoing and all the projects that are already scoped out and are ongoing. Um, the second one would be a focus on the dams and the function of those dams, Conroe, uh, Houston, um, and... Uh, the, the, the third one would be a look at the communities and the housing within the communities um, because we also look, have to, to look at where people live and where businesses are located. And so my uh, colleague Arturo, who refused to join us up here, I'm going to call you out, uh, he's, a, he's a big proponent of uh, the ponding. You, you guys heard that a lot of the flooding occurred in places outside of the 100-year floodplain, right? So, so when the rain falls, it doesn't, you know, target itself to the bayous. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, these, these great guys, their work is constrained to that, to that because that's where the majority of the water is. Uh, the ponding issues tend to be more of a city issue or a county issue or a mud issue. And so if the land is graded very nicely down to the river, the water will get there. But as we know, it may or may not be that the case. And so ponding is a major issue. When we talk about ponding, we also recognize the fact that when the rain falls, it doesn't fall in a blanket across the area. But, you know, we heard we had 51 inches of rain, right? It's going to fall in different places at different uh, levels. So in terms of trying to model, these guys are having the job... You know, bless your heart. He, <laughs> he, he has the job of trying to figure out the pre-Harvey levels yes. as a technical approach to the issue because they have to figure out how to put something on paper that gets funded, right? Um, we are having the challenge of trying to figure out the scenario. What, what amount of rain should we be modeling for? And our expert here is telling us, well, you can't even do that. You have to model each rain event separately because the next time it rains, it will fall differently. It will never fall in the exact same way. Your neighborhood may get less or more next time. And so that's the extent of the ponding issue. And the only way to look at that properly is to look at the same LIDAR imagery, but all of a sudden now look at the street drainage or the open ditches network, you know, things like that. So there's a huge community uh, uh, component that needs to be at play. So, so we are taking a look at that. I'm glad you point that others are thinking the same way. In order to make a truly comprehensive effort, we need to look at a full-scale approach that includes all these things. Correct. So, um, 
It doesn't calculate it now. So we just did a uh, a very abridged version of the analysis because we're not actually assigned with determining where the sediment's coming from. We're determining we're, we're determined on reducing the flood in the area now to what it was pre-Harvey. It, it's not a part of our scope of work to just to do a, a regional study. Uh, we just wanted to know so that we were like, well, this is where this is where we believe it's coming from. Texas Water Development Board did a study on it. They say where it's coming from. So that was just something that we were like, that's something that needs to be out there in order for other people to notice. The other thing is, is that we used that study in order to base our report off of so that we had a direction to go so that we're not reinventing the wheel because they predicted this was going to happen in that 2000 report. So we're just following what they said 20 years ago. Um, and in order to do that, we were doing it in an abridged version so that we could get it funded. Otherwise, we would have no project. And you guys would be stuck at square one like we are now and waiting the three years for us to go through a study. So that's one of the things that we're doing to help this region. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, let's give them another hand. You guys can have a seat. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, okay, sure. Just real quick to follow up on him, uh, we have the full capabilities of doing wonderful things. And again, we're limited by a scope, but I wanna leave you all with this. We cannot, we understand the problem that it is out there. We understand that it's a big problem. And, but unfortunately, we can't lobby for you guys. So please contact your local officials. And that's really hard. You know, the big projects get funded for us, and I mean, just contact them, let them know. And that's how we get our funded for the big project, so we can look at it at a bigger picture and actually have the time to do it and make it, instead of just pre-Harvey, make it actually bigger and better. So, thank you. Well said, that's so important. Um, Thank you, gentlemen, for um, coming out and being with us today for all that you guys are doing. We understand that you have been giving your marching orders, and we appreciate what you guys are doing. Um, and to his point, there is a huge amount of work. We, we know that this problem has been around for a very long time, and um, unfortunately, the can has just been kicked down the road for decades. So it's not going to get fixed overnight with one project that with a very narrow scope, but at least it's going to get an apartment complex out of our lake and river. So continue to do what you're doing. Activate. Um, go to the, all the community meetings. Make your voices heard. Uh, and pay attention to what the chamber is doing in the Recover Lake Houston um, initiative that we have going on. We, have, we are pinpointing where we need to have our voices heard, how we can do that in a concentrated effort, and uh, continue to enable the changes that need to happen in our area. So something like this will not happen again. So we appreciate all that you guys are doing, have done, will continue to do. Um, and thank you for your attendance today. So let's thank our co-presenting sponsors once again.